Well, welcome everyone. I've got a fantastic guest today. My name is Steve and you're listening to 100% on not in your business, where we talk to business owners, business coaches, and those that serve businesses about the challenges those owners have getting out of the day to day, getting out of the weeds and leveling up working on their business because when they work on their business, they drive their customer count, they drive their revenue, they develop their employees and ultimately their business achieves the vision that they set out for. I'm very excited today. I've got Andrew Thompson. Andrew, you've got um, a lot of experience in the business world. You're the founder of Landmark Advisors, general counsel for Bahala Business Brokers, and the CEO of the C-Suite Exchange. Welcome today. I'm really excited to have you. It's great to be here with you, Steve. I'm excited as well. Perfect. Thank you. Well, you know, when we were talking, your just breadth of experience was really interesting to me and I think will be to our guest. One of the things, though, as a business owner, you, you, you face your own struggles and challenges working on your business versus in. And then you shared with me that you're actually going through a process right now to kind of reboot your business. And I'm sure that comes up with its own uh, challenges and uh, hurdles, if you will, to overcome. So I'm really interested to hear about your experience uh, rebooting that and uh, what you're what you're seeing in your business world right now. Yeah, well, I, I love the introduction that you made, Steve, not for me so much as the process of working um, on your business and not in your business. If you're uh, a law practitioner, if you're an, an attorney, <clears throat> you are inevitably, you're someone that's working in the business. Sure. You may not realize it. You may not think of it that way. You may think of yourself as the advisor and the expert. Many times you are, but um, you're always facing the challenge. If you're not billing hours, you're running case management to try to get to the end of the game and collect on a contingent fee. <clears throat> or you might be working on a flat fee basis, but any way you go, you are directed back again and again to working in the business. That was one of my frustrations over, over the years. I've been licensed in the state of Indiana for over 30 years, started my own practice there 12 years ago and you know split my work between litigation and transactions, primarily small scale M&A transactions. And um, I could see that the opportunities, that the impact that I could have could be so much greater if I was working with a broader network, if I was working on deals instead of in the middle of them. So I love the focus that you have and yeah, I absolutely face those challenges. And I've decided over a series of iterations of where, where I've come to today to make it work differently than it ever has in the past. I'm really excited about it. Right. Yeah. You, you know, um, well, my background as an accountant, now I don't practice anymore, but I definitely can relate to you as, as a professional service provider. If you're not putting your stuff out there and, and accumulating those billable hours, you're going to be out of business pretty soon. So it's very hard for yourself like an attorney not to be working in that business because that's what people are coming to you for is to be able to provide the service that you have. Exactly. How did you, how did you come about that realization that, um, you know, we talk a lot in this show about it's a problem of scale. And it sounds like you were getting to a point where you're realizing you, uh, you by yourself cannot scale. But how did you get to that point and realize that you've got to look at your business differently so that um, you can level up and work on your business? Well, as it climbed the path to the seventh heaven, I've already charted my way through a couple couple levels. And the first level was just the excitement. I, in 2012, uh, when Congress passed the JOBS Act, nobody understood what it was about very well as an acronym for Jumpstart Our Business Startups. And uh, it presented an opportunity to uh, create crowdfunding platforms and to invest through a new idea of crowdfunding. Um, there were no experts in the field, and I kind of became a uh, resident expert on because people would ask me, can you explain this? And, you know, so I was invited to several seminars, uh, networking groups to speak on issues relating to, to crowdfunding. That in and of itself, the whole crowdsourcing idea, looking beyond the business that you have, looking for investors from beyond your network of immediate friends and family, 
and so forth, opened my eyes to the potential of, you know, scale, scaling a business. Um, that didn't, it, well, I then attempted to get a crowdfunding platform off the ground. I had two partners. Um, we ended up uh, abandoning that project in 2017 because it, uh, uh, because of the regulatory environment was just so oppressive where we thought that, you know, $600,000 would launch our platform and get us running off the races. <clears throat> Instead, we probably needed several million and we weren't ready for uh, that type of raise. So um, went back to the drawing board and I went back to practicing law again, looking at becoming more of an advisor in the M&A space. Um, but yet again, uh, similar challenges cropped up uh, just in different ways. And 2019, the second layer of epiphany, the big one to me is my life has got to be different or life is going to dictate to me that it will be different because I, I found out that you know, based on heredity and stress that I needed bypass surgery. So in July of 2019, uh, I underwent uh, quintuple bypass and um, emerged from that and spent the next six to nine months thinking about, you know, um, what does the rest of my life look like? What does the rest of my career look like? What do I really want to accomplish? What do I want to do? Um, then COVID hits and, you know, some people were, and nobody was ready for it. Some people seized on the opportunities that were created. Some people took enormous hits. I was kind of a little bit on the sidelines at, at that point in time and watching what was going on. And so I was still in Indiana. I moved here to the Dallas Fort Worth area just last January. And one thing I've seen is that the opportunities to network, meet people, have cocktails, coffee, conversation, and talk about deals is just uh, unbelievable in, in this area. Um, there are more um, private equity professionals, there are more deal professionals, there are more intermediaries probably than anywhere in the United States right now. And there are more deals per capita uh, occurring as we sit here on this podcast today, probably than anywhere else in the United States. And many of them are multinational, um, U.S., you know, uh, countrywide, whatever uh, deals, but they're, they're happening as we sit here and 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 talk. But a lot of what is not happening are other deals that could, should, would, if the focus was more directed toward the activity of the deal. So it's a funny counterbalance, as I see it, between individuals stepping out of working in their business to work on the business and the counterbalance of people working around deals to work on deals. Um, because if people can walk around every side of it, talk about it all day, even get into LOIs and due diligence sometimes. And if you're not really prepared, if you don't know where you're going, it, you know, any, any path will get you there. Right. So, um, having a greater focus and understanding the challenges and problems and how to solve them, I think is so important. Everybody wants to be a deal maker, but not many people have an understanding of, of what that means. And they're just shopping. So, you know, we want to elevate people from shopping for deals to actually making them happen and getting to them efficiently and effectively with the right match. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that makes complete sense. And there was a, there was an early guest. He told me that when anybody starts a business more often than not, they haven't even thought about their exit plan. They're just focused on getting the doors open, getting the product, getting the service out the door and, and starting to build customer base. He advised that that's, that's the most important time when you need to have your exit plan already figured out because that to your point is where you're moving towards. Right. But that every action that you take in your business from that point forward is in service to you exiting that business and hopefully, you know, taking the taking the uh, money out of it and, and uh, achieving your goals at retirement or, or your next phase in life. But right. it's a great point that a lot of people don't think about the deals and work on the deal uh, in that fashion. Yeah, I mean, you know, business exits for, you know, uh, hate to be crass, but they're, they're like marriage exits. They occur one of two ways. 
uh, voluntarily or involuntarily. Right. And uh, you may want your marriage to last until you die. But most people want to walk away from their business while they're still alive. They want to have a happy exit. So it's a little bit different. It's not a divorce. It's a deal. And it's the next level of deal. And, you know, on the other side of transactions, too, I find that the buyers and investors are so many folks searching out there. I've worked on the more on the buy side of transactions than the sell side. And one of the things that I have seen um, that just makes me scratch my head is how often, you know, if, if you think it's rare for a uh, business owner or for a startup entrepreneur to think about their exit um, because it's so far out in the future, it's even more rare for a business buyer to think through execution on the other side of a deal primarily because it is so much right in the immediate presence and they have to focus so much on uh, what's in front of them if they want to get to the closing table. And I, I you know, and I do, as I, I said before, I encourage people to keep that focus on getting to the closing table, but you also should be very carefully considering, do you have the management team in place? Do you have the resources you need? What do your projections look like after you get in? What's your game plan for making changes to the business model that, that exists today? And so, you know, I think there is a shortfall between the um, actual capacity to make a deal and the um, understanding of what you're going to want to make that deal successful when you get on the other side. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What, what do you see, regardless of whether it maybe is a startup business owner or someone who's acquiring an established business, do, do you see common themes in the challenges they have? Because they both are new relative to the business and getting out of the weeds and making sure they can focus on the business with the right team underneath them. What kind of challenges do you see the most common? That they share in common? Is that is that the yeah. question? Yeah, well, you know, really, except for the fact that the capitalization of the acquire or of a new company is at a, as a high, at a higher level, typically than the startup. That's not always the case. Sometimes startups are well-funded, but the vast majority of them are, you know, in at some point in bootstrapping mode. <laughs> and so, um, but if you move beyond that, okay, and then, and you look at what their, uh, a startup is doing versus uh, a newly acquired owner of a company, yeah, it's very similar. I mean, I, I, the the key components that are not there at your fingertips that you need at your fingertips are good, sound, C level management. And here, here's the thing that I see is there's there's a ton of great um, CEOs out there. I mean, you know, frankly, a CEO is. In, in our world today is someone who's a, a risk taker and they get rewarded for taking risk. They're not managers. I mean, if you go back to um, the, the e-myth and the idea of the different roles that people play, uh, most CEOs are primarily risk takers. Now they become managers in small businesses over time, but they don't manage all of the component parts. They're, most of them are not great or even good at the technology piece of the business. Most of them are really good at sales, but they're not great oftentimes at operations. And most of them really are somewhat lacking and deficient in their fi financial skills. Guess what? Those are all the same attributes you can find for the typical startup entrepreneur. They're lacking in the same thing. So the ability to find, network, meet, and get to the right resources at the right cost for your budget to fill in the gaps that you have is vitally important, both to the newly acquired owner and, and also to the, to the startup. They, they're very much in common. The, the other similarity I see, and this goes back to the theme of your podcast, is that the temptation becomes very, very um, prominent to work in the business, to get yourself distracted by what's going on in the business. I fight that quite intentionally, forcefully, and um, 
you know, vocally, even to the risk of, uh, you know, having to uh, come back, you know, they say, ask, uh, better to ask forgiveness and permission. Sometimes the people that you're working with that implement the key parts of the business for you, you know, you have to come back to them and say, look, I, you know, I got to delegate that. I can't spend time there if I'm going to work on the business and scale it and grow it to what it should be to, so it meets its full potential. Right. Well, you know, this, this is an interesting debate and it comes up sometimes in these, these episodes where uh, there's a side of the argument that says the business owner should understand, especially in the startup situation, should understand all aspects of their business, not necessarily have to run them all day to day, but should understand all aspects and may even have played a big, big part in developing all the processes and technologies that the business runs. And then ultimately they get into that trap of, well, now they got to get out of it and now they've got to scale. And so the other side of that argument is early, early on, <laughs> hire the right skills or outsource the right skills, whatever, but bring the right skills into the business to yeah. do exactly that. And they don't need to know all aspects of the business. Mm -hmm. But where do you stand on that? And how do you coach business owners in that respect? Well, because of our inherent biases and natural tendencies to fall into the trap of being stuck in the in the business and the processes. Look, I think, you know, designing processes um, is a really vital part of entrepreneurship. But the design and implementation are two very different things. If you want to know all the interworkings of a business, if you want to become, a, look, there's franchises out there that have designed models for you. You can buy a franchise at, that potentially works and be a manager. That's what franchising is about. If you're anything but a franchise, if you have a bigger vision than the the box that your business lives in, um, the real estate space where you, you occupy, if your vision goes beyond to other places and other parts of missions and the potential for growth outside of your walls, then um, I would, if I err, I would tend to err on pushing people much more toward the notion of delegation, outsourcing as early and as often as possible. Um, the idea is that if your idea is good, if what you're doing is good, if it, it's, it, if it provides a good, meaningful, useful service, the more people you can reach, the better. And the best way to reach more people is to design systems that enable that reach. And that means hiring, outsourcing, bringing in other people to the team and not trying to do it all yourself. Yeah, right. if, you're, if you're wanting to scale, you're going to need to bring in the help early on to be able to scale your product or service across all the, the customers that benefit from it. That's great advice. Um, when you when you talk to business owners and they're like, oh, Andrew, I just, I just can't afford it. How do you get them past that so that they realize there's a payback into the future that, yeah, of course, they have to estimate and, and uh, be comfortable with what that payback's going to be, but the investment now is for the payback in the future. How do you handle that conversation? Well, um, you know, that's evolving for me to be, to be candid. I, I've had to have that conversation with myself a couple of times over to get there. So um, as far as what I, you know, what I want to convey to the business owner in, in that situation is there yeah, absolutely there is a payback. Can you afford not to do it. I mean, think about where you are. Think about how your business, my business grows 15 to 20% every year. That's fantastic. So why are you thinking about doing something else? Well, I'm getting older. I don't want this to occupy my time anymore. I, you know, um, plus when I look at what I've earned and what I can get, if I, if I sell it, it's quite a, quite a bit more than that. Um, but are you ready for, for prime time? Are you ready to be able to do that? The biggest issue that I have with business owners that I work with right now today is to get them to focus on what does good financial health really look like from inside your company? What's it look like to a potential buyer? What's it look like to a bank? If you're going to have a conversation 
with any successors, if they're your employees, even your family, you know, what does that look like and how can you present that in such a way that it, it actually is telling a, a true story? And most people, frankly, are not ready to do that. Once they take that step and they begin to put the numbers on paper and look at it and think about the differences between where they are and where they've been, they really have a tendency to start thinking about their business very differently. And they will take a step back and say, hmm, well, you know, there's a cost cutting measure here I need to put in place. And here's, here's where I can gain some efficiency in that area. Oh, by the way, there's a market that we've missed. We, you know, we need to be doing more to, to reach out to that. And I just didn't have to think strategically because everything has kind of fallen in my lap so far. But, you know, you want to position yourself so that you don't sell yourself short. And I think, you know, in terms of whether or not you can afford to do it in some way or another, you can't afford not to do it. I love a negotiation strategy that says, hey, um, you talk to somebody on the other side of the table, they set a price. Okay, you set the price, I get to set the terms. Oh, um, but if they say they really want to set the terms, then you say, okay, well, let's work on the price side of that and what it makes sense for me from a budget standpoint to invest in it. All of a sudden, you're looking at creating partnerships <clears throat> instead of you know paying money out of pocket that you don't know that you have are going to get a return on. And when you have partnerships, everybody, it's a win-win situation. Everybody is in it together. Yeah, absolutely. Back to, it's funny you say that. I was just thinking about this the other day. It's a, it's a, it's a mindset shift. A lot of people think it's a zero-sum game. You know, if someone's got to win, someone's got to lose. But when you approach the negotiation with that win-win, I bet it's a much more fruitful business relationship. And um, uh, ultimately, the deal uh, finalizes in a much better situation for everyone involved. I've had to learn that the hard way myself. <laughs> but it's a good lesson to learn and know. Yeah. Well, so this has been fantastic. How, how would people get in contact with you? And you've got a lot of expertise in your area. Um, what would be maybe the top one, two, maybe three things that they would want to reach out to you about? So first of all, they can reach me at Andrew at landmarkadv.com. That's Andrew at Landmark Alpha Delta Victor.com. Um, I'm available for phone consultation most of the time, 317-600-1665. But if they email me, I can send them a calendar link and we can plan a time so that we know we're both available. That's a lot more efficient, usually on both sides. Sure. <laughs> and so those are the easiest ways to reach me. I encourage people to look at my LinkedIn profile to get an idea, their idea. I mean, you can definitely go to my website as well, but I think it, my LinkedIn profile probably tells you better who I am. Um, and then um, in terms of the two or three things that, that I think I do most effectively is we've what we did to iterate uh, Landmark Advisors and create C-Suite Exchange underneath it was to go from seeing ourselves as solely a provider of services to a connector of those people who um, do provide the services well. So we work with um, all different uh, disciplines in the, in the C-suite from uh, CFOs, chief operating officers, technology at IT, um, general counsel, I do, the, do those services myself. Um, from time to time, we work with valuation experts, et cetera. So that's kind of our forte. As for me, you know, I try to be a deal maker where I can. I get inquiries almost every day now about an opportunity to buy or sell a business. So if we can talk about, if you're looking for a business in particular, let's, let's talk. If you want to buy a business, you're in position to buy a business, you're thinking about how to go about buying a business. That's a great conversation for us to have. And, um, you know, when I, and I just want to encourage people too, and I connect people to the team over at Valhalla, if you're wanting to sell a business, doesn't matter what kind of business you're in, if you're in a position to exit or plan an exit, and again, I get involved in the earlier stages with helping people pre-plan for exits, we look at six to 24 months of exit coaching so we're ready to get a deal listed um, that far in advance because we find that most people that take that time to do it are going to be the best prepared 
for what they ultimately want to accomplish. Right. And ultimately get, get the value out of their business. Yeah. I know Brad and Andrew at, at Valhalla, fantastic uh, group of fellows and uh, definitely a good, strong recommendation. Yeah. So again, it's, um, you want to reach me, it's Andrew at landmarkadv.com. Um, and if you need to catch me immediately because something's so hot and ready, text or call me at 317-600-1665. I've kept that Indianapolis area phone number as I've been transitioning into the marketplace down here. You know what? It used to be uh, people wouldn't accept phone calls from the local area code, but now we all carry our numbers with us indefinitely. So Yep. No worries. Well, Andrew, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate you spending the time talking with me, talking with the guest. I hope um, they found a lot of value in it. I know I certainly did. So I, I appreciate your time. I appreciate the opportunity to be on, Steve. Thank you so much. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, business owners, you know, all, all of your listening audience can benefit tremendously from what you're doing. So thank you.